Active sanctions, if you think back to that time, the idea was we would be very explicit with Russia about the sanctions that would snap in in the event of an invasion. So we were working on that. So that was kind of a third area I was very aware of. I thought then, and I think today, that Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which of course did ultimately happen, is the biggest challenge to Canada's national security since the Second World War. I, th I think it's a very serious attack on Western democracies, on the rules-based international order. I took it seriously then, and I believed it was really important for Canada to be in a strong position to be able to respond. Okay. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, <laughs> So, there was a lot going on. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to go over a couple of points and then and then move on. But so the last point you raised was a, what was going on on in Ukraine. You saw a, a link to that in Canada's national security. So that that link may not be obvious. It's something that's going on in the other end of the world. So what do you mean by that? That would be a, a risk to Canada's national security. Well. Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine is the first time that one internationally recognized state has tried to take, has tried to conquer or seize the territory of another since the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. It's a very grave violation of what I think is one of the greatest accomplishments of the post-World War II international order, which was, you know, a basic, basic understanding that internationally recognized countries don't invade each other and seize each other's territory. Now, that has not been perfectly honored, but if you compare the entire post-World War II period with all of human history prior to that, it's a huge change. And that has hugely enhanced the security of every country in the world. So that's number one. Number two way that Canada's security is th was threatened, is threatened, but I think our, I think the allied response has been strong and has strengthened Canada, is I absolutely believe don't recall the exact dates myself, but I do know we didn't have the mandate and then it came into force. Right. And just so the folks at home understand, a regulation is a different type of law. It's passed by the executive branch alone, not by all of parliament, right? Like the Emergencies Act. There is absolutely a distinction between things a government can do by regulation and things it can right. only do by legislation. Right. And so uh, would, you be, would you agree with me that given that the during the throes of the pandemic, from March 2020 through to January 15th, 2022, and we had no regulation, you didn't need one. No, uh, I actually, I believe that taken as a whole, the public health measures that Canada put in place were very, very important oh, I understand the that, health and safety just gonna, of Canadians. I only have so much time, so I'm going to cut you off there. And you'd agree with me that given that there was no regulation in place from March 2020 through January 15th, 2022, you know, during the throes of the pandemic, there was no reason to pass one on January 15th, 2022, was there? There was no health risk. No, I'm afraid I don't agree. In January, we had an Omicron wave. We were still fighting COVID, and there was a real value in encouraging as many Canadians as okay. possible to get but, vaccinated. But so the, well, the purpose was to encourage Canadians to get vaccinated, to compel them to get vaccinated. Is that fair? That's right. All right. So that was the purpose of the regulation. That was the true purpose. It wasn't to keep people safe. It was to get them vaccinated. I believe then, and I believe now, that creating strong incentives for Canadians to be vaccinated, protected the health okay. of vaccinated Canadians, and protected the health so, of our country overall. Okay, so 
from March 2020 to uh, January 15th, 2022, did you fail to protect Canadians without having that regulation? Let me start with one aspect of that timeline, which is obviously when COVID first hit us, vaccines didn't exist. And then even when vaccines arrived, it took time for them to be distributed. So of course, vaccine mandates couldn't be put in place before vaccines existed okay. or were made available. So, and of course the government, you ended up creating a vaccine compensation fund in December of 2020, do you remember that? Yes, I do. Right, and you're aware that Quebec had a vaccine compensation fund and it was the only province that actually had one prior to that? I am prepared to accept that that's the case. I can't recall specifically. And can you agree with me that the United States has a federal vaccine uh, compensation fund? Again, I'm prepared time. to accept okay. that that's the case. So from 1867, when Canada was founded, up until December of 2020, Canada had no federal vaccine compensation fund. Can you agree with that? Again, I'm not an expert in the history of vaccine compensation funds in right. Canada. But first, comp you can agree the first compensation co fund in Canada for vaccines came about only because of the COVID vaccines, correct? Again, I'm, I'm really not an expert in vaccine compensation funds. If, if the direction of the question is to suggest that the COVID vaccines are more dangerous in some way than previous vaccines we've used in Canada, I'll say one, I'm not a health expert, I but I believe I very much uh, in really the advice, the effectiveness, the thoroughness of Health Canada. Okay. They're very good at I, judging I, I the agree. safety of vaccines. I, well, and I will say I, instances, um, very, very limited actually compared to the damage being done to Canada. And if I may, you know, had what was happening in Canada being about, um, I don't know, the, the field behind the National Art Gallery being occupied for a long time, and maybe some comparable public park in Windsor being occupied, and so on across the country. Um, that would have been entirely legitimate protest, but that wasn't what was happening. Okay. Maybe I can take you to an example closer to home. When, for me, when Solidarity had a general strike in Poland and blocked the ports, Western democracies applauded that action. That was economic disruption was viewed as a legitimate form of political protest at that time. I'm going to allow myself one personal comment, which is I did make a bet with myself that you and I would end up talking about Solidarność. Oh, yeah, you um, know, coming from the Eastern Bloc, it was going to happen. Um, yeah, I am aware of that. And um, I don't think you'll be surprised to think that I thought about that at the time. And more recently and more specifically, I thought about the Maidan in Ukraine and w when we took this action. And let me talk about a few differences. And the main one is this. Solidarność, as you know very well, was a protest against a government that was illegitimate that was where, from whence it drew its power and legitimacy. This was people rising up against an authoritarian, and I would even say in the case of Poland, colonial regime. Okay. I, in I, Canada, what happened was a democratically elected government that was actually acting on policies that we had campaigned on just that summer. So it was a fresh democratic mandate. There was no lack of transparency with the people of Canada. And people who disagreed with those policies were holding the country's economy hostage. Okay, and Spear, that just, was not appropriate. I just, 
I, I do want to raise a concern. I, I, I'm assuming you're not saying that democracy only operates at the time of, of, of casting our ballot. Obviously, I think you acknowledge that we are able to protest in between those times. So even after you were democratically elected, people could protest your government's policies, correct? A hundred percent. And and I that in a democracy, the right to protest is important and has to be protected. And yeah, I obvious, I mean, that's such an obvious statement. And I agree with that. And I agree. Yeah. So I, since it's obvious, I'll say it and I won't gild the lily. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Commissioner Rulo. Okay, um, we have five minutes left. I don't know if uh, the Canadian Constitution Foundation wants to start or... I can't hear lunch, but I'm in your hands. ...but decided that, you know, making a change to it, you know, the legislative amendment would take too much time. Do you recall your evidence earlier today about that? Yes, I do. All right, and so... Um, just so that we're all clear, because we have Canadians watching who may not understand the process, the money, the proceeds of crime and money laundering and terrorist financing act, it gives um, the ability to create regulations, right? If your question is, was it possible to grant FinTrack, to give FinTrack these expanded powers through regulation. That is correct. And I said that this morning. We did Thank go you. on to grant those powers through regulation. And there's just a difference between how regulations are passed versus, say, example, legislation or amendments to legislation. The latter is what you have to do, the three readings, going to Senate. It's a much longer legislative process. That's fair? A hundred percent. And by comparison, passing regulations is a much shorter process. Absolutely. Okay. Those are all my questions. Thank my name is Alan Honor. I'm a lawyer at the uh, Democracy Fund, and we share status with the, um, the JC Stuff and Citizens for Freedom. Uh, Ms. Freeland, in your witness statement, you mentioned challenges to supply chains as being uh, a major focus for you in January of 2022, uh, but you didn't mention the government vaccine mandate for truckers, and I'd just like to ask you a little bit about that. Can we please pull up OTT uh, 3027621.0001? And Ms. Freeland, while we're waiting for that to come up, uh, this is a, a letter which is addressed to you and other ministers by the Canadian Trucking Alliance. And it's dated December 10th, uh, 2021. I'd like to take you through part of this letter, but before I do that, can you tell me, do you know who this group is, the Canadian Trucker Alliance? I can't say I'm familiar with them right now. Maybe I've heard of them, but. Okay, well, I, I think we've heard some evidence about them, but if you're not familiar with them, that's okay. Let's just go down uh, to the first paragraph here. And Ms. Freeland, I just want to read this to you. It says that the Canadian Trucker Alliance is disappointed to learn that our current exemption from the national vaccination mandate is being removed, considering the immense impact this decision will have on already beleaguered supply chains. Do you see that? I do. Okay, and if I can take you to another part of that letter, just on the second page, second paragraph, please. Here we see um, CTA estimates that combined the proposed vaccine mandate for cross-border truck drivers and the federal sector mandate announced by the Minister of Labour would remove between 15,000 and 30,000 Canadian drivers from the interprovincial and international supply chains. The expected loss of transportation services, service capacity will trigger significant ripple effects throughout the entire economy. And Ms. Freeland, I just want to, 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 to ask you, this is something you knew about uh, when the exemption for, uh, for truckers was removed in February. You knew that this might have some effect on the supply chain. Is that fair? I knew that some people asserted that it might. Okay, thank you. And I, I'm going to suggest um, 
This is not the first time this group wrote to you. If we can scroll down to page five, please. Uh, we have another letter just to the, to the top. The, in addition to, we'll, I'll look at this email. So there was email traffic and there, there would have been phone calls the week of the 17th between PCO and PMO. The Tuesday the 25th, I do believe, was the first meeting scheduled with PCO and PMO staff to, to go through all of the elements as were known at that point. Okay, so we're just gonna look at, uh, at what the content of that meeting was. Mr. Clerk, if you can scroll down, keep scrolling. Okay, there we go. So this is Mike McDonald and we know, can you actually just refresh our memories as to who Mike McDonald is? So we don't have a confirmed date for this one, but uh, it, it must be some February 8th. Thank you. Um, and this is a text between you and, and Ms. Astrovis, a text exchange. And uh, she says to you, she's in the blue here. Marco, that's a reference to Minister Mendicino, hasn't heard back from Sylvia Jones. That's a reference to uh, the Solicitor General of Ontario on the meeting with the three orders of government, reference to the tripartite. And you say, yeah, because they don't want to be a part of it. And she says, oh, I know. And you say, so anything I should do, we should just go ahead without them. And then it goes on. So can you contextual contextualize that for us a little bit? Yeah, as, as they were getting kind of pushed back and were just not support uh, from their counterparts, the Solicitor General in particular, they had asked me to connect with my contact in the Premier's office and to just check and see if, if was, was this something that uh, the entire government or this minister, just to kind of ascertain some of those kind of uh, contextual details. So I did, uh, I, I chatted with, with, uh, with Jamie Wallace and, and it was clear that, that they were kind of, they had a different approach and strategy um, and the tripartite table was not a priority for them at that time. Sorry, who is Jamie Wallace for the record? Sorry, Jamie Wallace is the chief of staff to Premier Ford. Okay, so you had a conversation with Mr. Yeah. Wallace, Chief of Staff to Premier Ford, and the- And Nunavut brought up and concern from the Premier in the Northwest Territories about a blockade, um, concerns from Premier Horgan about RCMP being stretched too thin um, as they were, a contingent had been sent to, to support uh, an, another part of the country. And it really kind of showed that the, the national nature of it and, and the kind of variety of issues uh, folks were facing. Um, and, and even the folks who were, I would say, um, more concerned, um, such as the, the Premier of Alberta or the Premier of Saskatchewan, you know, even they had said things like, well, I won't quibble with the use of the Emergencies Act, but I'm worried about inf inflaming folks, which was something we were concerned about, had talked about at IRGs, was a real cause um, of, of discussion. Um, and, and same with, with, with Premier Mo, who said, you know, the, the six things you've mentioned sound reasonable, but I'm worried about infl in, inflaming. So, um, you know, and, and and even even you know Premier Legault talking about um, you know the sort of Quebec. S S M dot can dot seven seven one nine. Okay, so. Ms. Telford, uh, Sarah Jackson, she's your office manager, is this correct? Uh, yes. All right. And so obviously she's a scribe and does uh, scribing for you when you're in meetings? No. All right. So the notes that she takes, uh, she has, if we can scroll down and down. Right. So that says KT call, and I take it that's you? KT usually does refer to me. Right, so she's taking notes of a phone call she has with you? I don't know. You don't know. So that's on February 4th. Do you remember February 4th? Yes. Okay, so what happened on February 4th? Um, 
Well, no, I don't remember in that level of detail. Okay. Is there something you're looking for in particular? Well, I'm trying to find out, because I have to build a record for this. Do you have any idea why anything in your conversation on February 4th in that note would be irrelevant? I don't know. And I take it when you spoke to Ms. Telford, or sorry, to uh, this uh, individual at the time, there was no lawyer present, was there? I don't know what this call is. Okay, so can we scroll down then? So you see there, the government has claimed solicitor client privilege, okay? And you don't remember speaking with a lawyer on February 4th, do you? As I said, I don't know what this call is. Right, so how would the government know, if you don't know, that this is solicitor client privileged? They couldn't, could they? So, uh, Tom Curry for uh, Chief Slowly. I understand you were interviewed by the Commission Council November 17th. Uh, yes, that's correct. And can you just tell the Commissioner, how long were you with the Commission Council for that interview? Uh, 94 minutes in total. And did you have access to the, to the, to the information uh, to any information during the interview, or was it, uh, well, I'll just stop there. Did you have access to information during the interview? Uh, I did, sir. Including the the um, the films, or recordings at least, of the Police Services Board and Council meetings concerning the Ottawa Police Services Board? No, sir, I did not have access to any, uh, any video films. Okay. Now, um, just in terms of the chain of command at at the Solicitor General's uh, ministry, I understand that you are the, of course, you're the Inspector General of Policing and you have a direct report to the Deputy Solicitor General. Is that true? Yes, sir, that's correct. And then reporting to you is the Manager of Police Services Liaison or the Police Services Liaison Unit, correct? That's correct. And then below that uh, office are the police services advisors of, of, of whom you have spoken uh, to my friend. Is that right? Yes, sir. And the, and the idea is that the police services advisors uh, attend some or all police services board meetings. That's correct. In this case, it the, uh, the Ottawa Police Services Board is in... Um, was in the hands of Ms. Gray, Lindsay Gray, for the for the the time up until February fourteenth. If I got that, um, I I don't I don't accept the the uh, the statement that they were in the hands of uh, Ms. Um, Ms. Gray was providing professional guidance, uh, fulfilling her duty. Uh, as a police service advisor for the Ministry of the Solicitor General. I, I shouldn't. I, I I meant that only in the in the sense that she she was the. Isn't it? Yes, it is. Because it implies that uh, they may be asking themselves whether they need to consider their options, um, maybe under Section Nine of the Police Services Act, right? That and the fact that they, I think, it's a responsible thing to do for a board. Uh, to regularly ask the chief and ask themselves, are we in fact delivering adequate and effective policing and are we satisfying our legislative responsibility in the Police Services Act? Right. I mean, that, that's something that should be done regularly, but certainly if that question is being asked in a crisis, it's not a routine question. It's being asked because there are concerns uh, as to whether adequate and effective police services are being delivered at that time. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yes, I would agree that uh, throughout the um, a major event that it would be appropriate for a board to ask those questions of itself and of their chief. And you've said that the chief didn't give a direct answer on that question, right? That's correct. But you've also said that the chief acknowledged his inability to address the demonstration in Ottawa Folks, if you want to be keep up to date on what's happening at the Emergency Act Inquiry, including my live tweets and some clips and highlights that occurring at the Emergency Act Inquiry by heading over to revolutionnews.ca slash emergency act commission. That's revolutionnews.ca slash emergency act commission. 
And of course, here, folks, while you're there, please head over to donorbox.org slash emergency act commission. That's donorbox.org slash emergency act commission. And of course, here, folks, if you could chip in a pack or two, that will be greatly appreciated as it will help me cover my travel expenses, including my expenses on food as bringing you these stories doesn't come for free. Thank you so much.